Good morning and welcome to my workshop about the strategic approach to sustainable food security. Maybe a few words about myself. My name is Daniel Johansson. I'm half Swiss, half Swedish, living in Switzerland, married with four kids. And uh, I'm a marine engineer by profession and also worked on that, uh, in that profession for a few years. But then in 2015, I was asked to join the Global Food Garden Project. This is a project that concentrates on hydroponics and aquaponics. And I started off with the technical side and in the last years I've also been taking on the lead, so I'm leading this project. The Global Food Garden, it's, an, it's today mainly a network, a network of specialists, of companies and also organizations who look at hydroponics and aquaponics and see how they can use this in international development work. Hydroponic, that is a closed system where you don't plant the vegetables in soil, but in a non-organic substrate. And uh, the plants, they get the nutrition through the water. So in the water, you actually blend fertilizer in it. The water is circulated through the system and the roots of the plants, they can get, out, can get those uh, nutrition out of the water. One advantage is it's not uh, really connected to the soil. So if you have bad quality of soil or you're somewhere in an urban setting where you have a concrete flooring or so, it doesn't matter. It's not using a lot of water. You can save a lot of water up to 90%. And maybe also the third reason that's also very nice, especially Africa where you have rainy season and dry season, with this system you can harvest all through the years. If you then connect this hydroponic, you can do the same also with fish. So the feces, what comes out of the fish, bacteria take that and they can change that into nutrition for the plants. And the plants, again, they will take those nutrition out of the water and clean the water. So it's a circle where both sides, they can uh, get the best from one another. So one gets the nutrition, the other gets uh, the fish, get the clean water again. And the nice thing about that, so you will have both vegetables and you also have edible fish. What we try to do within the Global Food Garden is take this hydroponic and aquaponic solutions and simplify them in a way that they will also then work well in international devel development. You might ask why I was choosing this uh, topic and also this title. And when I chose this title, I actually realized it's much more than what I can, what I can give. And you will see throughout the presentation that we are looking more at the process. We don't have a finished product that we can give to you, but it's more a process, a vision that we are working to. And the whole Things started already some years ago, but last year at the Swedish Winter Challenge, we were also giving a presentation about wicking beds. That's one simple solution that you can use. And we had then after that a few people who were interested and we were walking this road together and just see on one side, how can we take the simple solutions and translate them to the African context, but also what is needed to make it successful around that, not, not just the product itself, but the whole setting. I think that's where a lot of this thinking started. Another thing that we also realized with the Global Food Garden before COVID-19 hit, we were looking more at a bit bigger systems, but they were often also a bit more complicated. So people were already depending on us already in setting the whole thing up, but also during operation that we from time to time could visit. And through travel restriction, we realized that we also need simpler solutions that work without much input from our side. And to really make this successful, we realized those technologies or solutions should actually at the end work without my input or from our side. The last point that also just motivated me to keep on with this topic is when I looked at some statistics. One is the statistics about people being hungry. It's now after COVID, it's more than, or during COVID, it's more than 800 million people who suffer from hunger. And you have daily about 24,000 people dying because of hunger. So that's every 3.6 second one person or every 10 second a child. Then also if you look at Africa on the statistics on what the expectations is for, pe for people growth, it's right now it's I think 1.3 billion people. By 2050 it should be 2.5 billion people. And by 2100 it should be about 4 billion people. And with this growth of people, I was just listening to a conference a while ago where someone from Africa was presenting these numbers and he said to actually feed these people only with vegetables, you would need farmland in the size of South Africa. In the title of this workshop, I was speaking about sustainable food security. So what does sustainable mean? 
I looked this up and sustainable actually has three aspects. So one is the ecological side. So it should be a solution that actually doesn't harm the environment, but actually helps the environment. But on the other side, you also have a social side. So it should actually help the people and not harm them as well. And the third point is the economical side, that is a system or solution that also pays off. And if you have those three points together, then you can talk about the sustainable system. So what are some challenges that you are facing in Africa? I would just like to present two persons that will just talk to you in some film clips. One is Manpan, you will know him from the Swedish Winter Challenge. And the other one is Estefano, he's from Mozambique. And I'll just give them a few minutes so they will show what challenges they are facing today. Hello, my name is Manpan Joseph Wungat. I am from Nigeria. I live in Abuja. I am by training a veterinary doctor, but uh, right now I'm a practicing uh, entrepreneur. I have uh, a commercial farm, which uh, I operate from the outskirts of Abuja. Um, I started farming for two key reasons. The first was the fact that I wasn't happy with what I was seeing around me. Uh, it seemed like for ages, Nigeria's agriculture had re remained rudimentary. Uh, farmers were using uh, crude implements like hoes and cutlasses to still farm in this age. Um, and I felt like something needed to change. Uh, for many years, I sat down with my friends and complained about this. Uh, then one day I realized that I needed to stop complaining and be uh, probably the answer to my own question. Uh, the second reason was basically because I saw a lot of young people unemployed, but completely uninterested in farming. Uh, many people would uh, rather be unemployed than go into farming. And they didn't see farming as a viable option to the white collar jobs that they were waiting for. My name is Stefano Carlos. I was born and raised up in Mozambique. I consider myself an entrepreneur. I moved at my father's parents when I was 10 looking for education, uh, where I went to a, a technical school where I learned about mechanics. And uh, after that, I did all I can to go for, to the university. My father and my mom taught me as we were grown, growing up, it was about working hard. And they always emphasized a man should eat from his labor. After I left my parents' house when I was a 10, I did not have resources to go to the university. And uh, that's where, for the first time, I decided to actually do a trade. What actually I started doing, which was buying peanut, raw peanut, and roast it and sell it on the streets. And afterwards, use the little profit to reinvest again in the business, uh, in the peanut business. And that exercise has brought me so many experience. It, it wasn't because of the amount of peanut that I sold, but it was the um, and how much I kept focused on selling the peanut because I knew that was the only thing I had to do in order to make a change in my life. And in fact, I learned to be persistent in selling and buying. Ten years ago, you will go in the city and find no letters because maybe the rivers don't have waters. People battle to produce letters. So what are the challenges? We heard from Manpan that he said the youth, there's a lot of unemployment, but they are not interested to go into farming because they don't see farming as a viable solution. It's hard work and you don't earn much out of it. Then Estefano was also touching the topic of knowledge. People don't know how to do it. Is it the technology they don't know? Maybe they don't know how to get fertilizers, seeds. There are many different topics where there's knowledge missing. But then also in Africa you have environmental problems. So you have a shortage of rain, of water in many places, or you will have a lot of heat, 
or then you have different seasons. You have rainy season where you can plant something, then it's dry season where nothing will grow. Another challenge is the whole cultural side. So you have cultural habits, you have the language. If you have new solutions, you need first to translate it into that. Then it can also be the avail availability, availability of seeds, of fertilizer, of spare parts. Maybe also one big thing, a challenge that I see is the whole side of the logistics. We had a young lady, she is working for the uh, FAO, for the Food and Agricultural Organization from the UN. And she was doing a project for us and she was looking at different numbers, putting them together. And she was comparing different countries, looking at the ag agricultural side. I'll have Germany, then I'll have Nigeria and Kenya. One of the statistics was about food loss in the whole production and transport. If you look at Germany, you have about 37% of what's produced is being wasted already in this time. It's mainly also because they want standardized sizes of vegetables, so the rest is not accepted. But if you look at Nigeria or Kenya, it's even 61% of what is produced or what is growing on the fields will never make it to the end user. It will already be wasted on the fields or in the transportation. So that's also a big challenge that we would need to look at and see how we can make this whole thing better. I've been looking at different ways of farming, maybe just quickly comparing, I will do that very shortly, but one that you have in Africa is your traditional farming, and we already said it's hard work and it's not really paying off, and it's very much connected to rainy seasons or seasons where you have enough water. If you compare now Germany or the other places where you have conventional farming, where you have big fields, there you have just a few people who will be able to do a lot of them. So also there I have interesting statistics. In Germany, <clears throat> about 1% of the people are involved or employed in the agricultural sector. And that's about 830,000 people. And they will look at <clears throat> more than 11 million hectares of farming land. In Kenya, you have 54% of the people working in the agricultural sector. So that's 26 million people. And they will look at about 5.8 5 million hectares of farmland, so it's about half the size of what is in Germany. In Nigeria, there's about 35% of the people work in the agricultural sector, so that's 70, more than 72 million people, and they are looking at 34 million hectares of farming land. So now, if you compare this, if we will now have the technologies like in Germany, where you only need 1% of the people working in that sector, then you would have many millions of local people who suddenly will be unemployed. So I don't think that is the solution for Africa where you look at big farms or big systems, but rather to see how can we have smaller units to actually keep these people employed in that sector. So they will continue to do their farming, but maybe just in a more effective way. Then there are other ways like permaculture or also reforesting and those things that will help the soil and that and the whole environment to get better, but that's also investment in the long time. So you start with that and only in a few years time will actually see a benefit. So that's more a, something that is will go over a longer range of time. Then the area where we are busy with hydroponics and aquaponics, that's something that will be able to produce vegetables right away. And it will do it with less water, with all the advantages that we already said. On the same time, it won't improve the soil or the environment because it's a closed system. So also there it will help in one side, but not on the other side. And then if you go even a step further to have vertical farming where you have indoor, it's with artificial light. It's like big factories and also there it's very expensive. It only needs few specialists to run it, but it could also produce a lot. And that's where I also was in this one conference where they were talking, is Africa ready for vertical farming? They said, yes, there is a need, but I don't think that that would be the right solution with these big units where you only, where you then, re then reduce the number of people working in these sectors. I would like to go back to Manpan and Estefano and just let them speak again also at different ways and solutions that they found. And then I'll try to wrap that together after that. Um, and I felt that something needed to be done. And in my own thinking, if we could find a way to make agriculture more attractive to these young people, it probably will draw many of them in and make them farmers. And so I started my farm with these two key reasons. To make my uh, idea attractive, I, I realized we needed to bring new ideas, more modern ways of doing things. Um, and so 
um, I decided that we should apply our minds to technology that was already available. Uh, uh, greenhouses, drip irrigation, precision agriculture, uh, using technology and innovation. Uh, those things were already uh, in use elsewhere. And I felt if Nigerian youth could do this, um, they would probably uh, be able to set themselves up as uh, agri-business agri entrepreneurs that will not only employ themselves, but become employers of labor uh, for, for the larger uh, society. And this is why we have um, decided to move to the next phase of our development, which is uh, uh, setting ourselves up as a training uh, uh, center or an agribusiness incubation center where young people can come and get some learning, hands-on training and internship on the farm and be able to um, uh, take that learning back and set up their farm businesses or set up their practices elsewhere. Our vision is to see high impact individuals trained by us uh, become uh, uh, practitioners in agriculture and also uh, be able to produce for regional and local consumption. Um, we hope that this will help to reduce the level of unemployment in our society and also uh, uh, help Nigeria to become uh, self-sufficient in food production uh, at, at the, in the long run. And as I saw the situation, I thought the best way to go around that will be to come up with a system that will produce letters 12 months a year. I came across the hydroponic principle. I started with five pipes where I produced about uh, 50 heads of letters every 35 days. And with these 50 uh, heads of lettuce, I was able to feed my family in terms of salads and then also share with some friends in the neighborhood. From five pipes, we went in um, to more than 200 pipes and uh, we are producing on a monthly basis about 2,000 to 2,500 uh, heads of lettuce. Unfortunately, you see the greenhouse is empty now. And this month, we are using it to maintain our greenhouse. I live in the, in the middle or amongst so many underprivileged people. It wouldn't make sense for me to have a lot when I see the neighbors are dying, when I see the neighbors are going through tough time, when I see that the neighbors are not, uh, they did not have education. So to me, I think the best way to share my investment is when you bring somebody who doesn't know to plant, you teach him to plant, and then you teach him to take care of the plant, and then you teach him to sell. If the person sells, that means there's one more Mozambican that has gotten a light. I like to train 12 people, in which the 12 people, they will train the other 12 people. But that's a concept that I learned from my father, and even if you go back in the Bible, we will see that uh, Jesus had uh, 12 disciples and the 12 disciples, they spread the gospel, they spread the word of God, and today the entire world is having a benefit to hear the word of God. So if I take this principle to train 12 people, out of those 12 people, at least each one of them, they must train 12 people. I mean, the next 10 years, we would like to have more than 500 people with successful farming. I'm starting to train in facility, not for my glory, not for my power. I'm, start, I'm starting to train in facility so people can see that it's possible to do change. I am blessed enough to see so many people that have gone through the training facility and they are doing well. And then I think I would say I can rest in peace at that time to, to be able to see that I was a big influence in people's lives. I hope you were encouraged by these two videos, what I was just sharing, and it's quite interesting to see how they do it. So both of them are looking, seeing the need that they need training center where they actually can, where people can come there for a period of time, it's that's maybe a year or half a year, and get to know those technologies and know how to run it. And they would like to include into the whole training, also the whole business side to learn them how to sell their products. So that's one side, but then also Stefano is quite interesting how he does it 
how he trains 12 people in the expectations that when they go home that they will pass on, each of them will pass on the knowledge again to 12 people. So you'll just see the whole knowledge will spread much faster. And I'll just like to put, try to put this now into a strategic full picture. So you have on one side, if we start on the local place where you have the farmer, I will call it the local food garden if you're playing with this word game of the global food garden. You have the local food garden, so he's the one producing. But he would need to go somewhere to learn how to, how to do it, how these new technologies work. And there I think it would work well with regional training centers. So over the country, if you have different places where they can go to, and those regional training centers, they will only have one or two solutions, but they will be the perfect solutions for that area. That's already proven. They know they don't have to do a lot of research, but they can start directly with the technologies. People can learn it and go home and start their own systems. So that's the regional side. And then if you go one step further, I would see the national, a national research and training center. I'll call it the National Food Garden. Because what I realized in this whole process, if you have those technologies, if we come up with good ideas here in the West, in Germany or in Switzerland, it doesn't mean automatically that it will work well in Africa. So you will have to bring it to Africa, translate it into local language, the concept, and then see, does it actually work? And if it works, what plants work well with that system, where you get your fertilizer, all those things from. And that will need some research to take those different technologies and see now, for example, for Nigeria, what does work. And when I have done that, and I know this is something that works, then I can start training the people on this and then spread that throughout the country. And if you put those two together, then maybe the region A is in the north, and they see that it couldn't be maybe a more desert situation. And they go there and they see, okay, from 10 solutions that the National Food Garden has, maybe solution A and B would work well for that area. So they only learn that and they will take that on to the north. Region B might be somewhere close to the coast where you have more rains and uh, more humidity and there may be different other solutions will work. So they will learn then that that work for their area. And then you will have this back and forth. They will be trained by the National Training Center, but what they experience, all they learn, would then also go back again to that National Training Center to help to actually gather all that knowledge in one place. So now we just we're looking at the National and the regional side. But what I also realized to actually make this work, we need to go one step further and that's where the global food garden comes in. So actually, you ha they will be the one who will gather together different technologies, see what works and already do some first research on that. And then they would have a big group of solutions that then from there we could pick and see what would work well for Nigeria. At the same time, if we have it in different countries, we can also learn from one another. So if Mozambique is making some good progress or experience with, for example, a certain type of lettuce, then we could also take that knowledge and tell them in Nigeria, look, you have about the same climate, the same condition, try this one. This might work well. And so the, the different countries can learn from one another. So not everyone has to start from scratch, but that we can have a platform where the knowledge that is there, that that can be spread and also so it comes back to one place and from there everyone would have access to it. Going back one and a half years, I was asking myself, where is my place in this whole picture? And I realized that for me, when, when looking at the whole picture, I saw there are many good solutions out there with people trying to have ways for food security. But often I also realized that they are very convinced of their own solution and they we're not so open to actually also look at other solutions to work together. I said this quite, was quite sad and said to really move forward with us, we would need a place where we get the different technologies together, where we, where the one can help the other. I don't think that one solution will do everything, but it's often a combination of different solutions where we can bring them together and then we really can see what works well for one country. And that's where I came up with this vision and you'll see this drawing here of this is a big farm. It's a farm could be here in Switzerland, but this has a lot of space where you can tr test different systems, we can do some research, but also where you can have people come there to be trained. So that's a bit where I see all this coming together. And I was showing this picture or this drawing to Manpan already a while ago, and he looked at that and said, wow, that's exactly the same thing that I actually would like to have in Nigeria, maybe with different buildings and all that, but the whole concept to have a place where you bring this all together and people can come there for training and really learn 
in a good way, just from first hand, just how to do it. And that's a bit where this whole vision came from. If we put this now all together, I also see that you're looking at the National Food Garden, there could be those training centers. And this is quite a big thing where we also could include the government, universities. And I think that could also be interesting for the UN or a World Food Program. But then if we break it down to different places regionally, maybe also smaller organizations can come in and say, I can't do the full picture or pay for the full training center, but I can have a small center there with someone who is capable of doing farming, will learn how to do it and then start a little training center in a regional area. So I think that's how we can bring this all together. And there is a lot of knowledge in our network. We have workshops we, uh, where we can produce also first part so we can have the full package to actually start this training center. And then maybe from there on, we'll also see how can we also do the whole production locally? Can we produce those systems? For example, in Nigeria, can we produce the seeds there? Can we produce the fertilizer, all those things there? So it's all locally and it's getting more independent from us. So my goal is not that everyone comes back to me and ask me to get help, but that that all can be done locally. So this is maybe one of the challenges to see how we can bring this all into the local context. The other thing is to see what solutions are out there and how can we simplify them that they will work well, for example, in Africa. Then the next step, like as Stefano shared, how can we spread this knowledge? How can we make it available and also spread it throughout the country? Yeah, as we also said before, it should be sustainable in all three different areas, both from the ecological side, from the economic side, and also from the social side. So that's also a challenge is how can we bring this all together? And maybe also the last point, it should create jobs. I don't want to have a solution that works well, but then after that, many people with, will go unemployed because they are not needed anymore, but much more it should in strengthen those farmers that are already out there and just give them a new way of doing it, that they can be more effective in it and produce in a better way. So that's about it. Maybe looking at next steps that we are taking. One is with this whole network of the Global Food Garden. We are looking to put this into a foundation to give it just more legal structure. So that's one side. And on the other side, Nigeria and Mozambique, we have those two centers where we're starting to build up those training centers as a pilot project to see what works well, what is still needed. And from there, we hope to actually find more people that we can have other countries as well, just coming in and this whole thing and say, okay, I'm ready to go this journey. It's not an easy journey. It will take a while to actually get to the point where it also starts to pay off. But those who say, I have this vision for my country, I would like to help my country and just to be ready that we can start walking, uh, walking this journey together. And we are, when we are at that place, then it's the last thing, but I don't think that should be a big problem when we have tackled the other things and see how we can get the finances to get this whole started. So yeah, as I said, Again, this is a process, it's a vision, it's something we're working towards. We don't have it finalized yet. But I hope this was encouraging to you and maybe also helping you just to see some steps further how this could work and see if that could also work for your country. And from here, we will now have a time of discussions. And maybe also from that, we can have more meetings later on to see how we can continue with this also working together with Swedish winter challenge with sustainable work cooperation and other partners as well so thank you for taking your time to listen to me and yeah we'll be see where we are going with this thank you